Hello and welcome to another episode of Blurble Reasoning, the show where I talk about books that I've read and my thoughts and opinions on them. If you are surprised to see a video like this on my YouTube channel uh, and are a new subscriber within the last five months, uh, this is a series I do. It has taken me five months to read this book. However, that does not mean that it was a bad book or that I had a bad time reading it. What it does mean, however, is that I'm going to be doing this with my notes and a hefty synopsis of the events of a book up in front of me so that I don't leave anything out. Today we are looking at the book A Crown of Swords by Robert Jordan. It is the seventh book in the Wheel of Time series, meaning that I am now halfway through the 14 book series. That's right. It's going to take me until early 2024 at this rate, but you know what? That's something I've made my peace with. It is an epic saga, and I am enjoying the long read-through, although I am going to alter how I end up reading through it, uh, which I'll talk more about right now. Let's talk about it right now, no need to bat around a bush. I've basically decided that to avoid me losing interest in the series, because reading book to book to book to book to book uh, can be a little brutal, uh, no matter how good the story is when it's this long, uh, I've decided I'm going to be reading a different book between every book. Um, so after this, I will be reading uh, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. So look forward to a blurble reasoning on that. And then after I have finished American Gods by Neil Gaiman, I will move on to the eighth book of a Wheel of Time series, and then a different book, and then the ninth book, and so on and so forth. You understand what I'm saying. You're intelligent. I'm doing this because I'm reminding myself that this is a book series that was brought out, you know, over the course of years, and that a lot of people would have read it as they came out. Uh, they wouldn't have just sat down and read 14 books back to back. That's slightly insane. I'm sure there are people who who have done this by the way but my brain is not one of those that can do that as we have found out within the last five months i'm also thinking that by doing this uh it's going to help me not maintain my concentration on the series as much as it's going to help me get rid of this weird fomo i'm carrying around of like it's going to take me years to finish this book series and there are so many other books i want to read in the meantime um this will be a nice way of you know interspersing books uh, I know my sister reads, like, up to three books at the same time. She just picks up the book she feels like reading at that particular moment. I used to be able to do that as a kid. Cannot do that as an adult. Anyway, that's a slightly longer uh, disclaimer than normal, so let's dive right into the blurb. A Crown of Swords by Robert Jordan. Now an original series starring Rosamund Pike as Moraine. Well, that's that's new, isn't it? Actually, you know what? I was going to read the blurb, but it's the same blurb that's been copied and pasted from the last few books. I think I had this problem last time as well. It's an outdated blurb. It doesn't actually reveal what's going on. Let's read the plot summary that someone, Tim, has posted on Wikipedia instead. Randall Four, the Dragon Reborn, prepares to attack the Forsaken Samael in Ilion while enjoying life with his friend, Min Fershaw, and attempting to quell rebellion by nobles in Kyrian, during which Pardon Fane severely injures him. After recovering, Rand, accompanied by Ashaman, defeats Samael in Shadar Logoth, where Samael is destroyed by Marshadar. Rand then takes the Crown of Ilion, formerly the Laurel Crown, but now called the Crown of Swords. One minor correction there, Mr. Wikipedia, he is accompanied by his Ashaman to Ilion, but he goes to fight Samael in Shadow Logoth alone. Mostly. We'll get to that. Egwene Alvear and Swan Sanche attempt to manipulate the Aes Sedai and Saladar against Elida's Aes Sedai in the White Tower. Investigating Myral Berengeri, I don't know how they say that name in the audiobook, but I swear I've never read that before. Egwene exploits the transfer of Land Mandragoran's water bond from Moraine to Morel to force Morel and Nisal to swear fealty to her. And finally, in the city of Ebu Dar and Altara, Elaine Drakand, Nynaeve Almira, Avienda, and Matt Coffon search for the Tarangrial, the Bowl of the Winds, to break the unnatural heat brought by the Dark One's manipulation of climate. They find it and enlist the help of the Kin and of the Afa'an Mir. They also confront a Golam. Matt is left behind and caught in the fighting as the Shan Chen invade Abu Da. I am so happy I listened to the audiobook or I'd have had no idea how to pronounce half of that. So there's other things that happen in the book too, but let's just go through those three main plot threads and talk about how I felt about them throughout the book at length. And then I'll go through my notes afterwards and bring up any points that I missed. By the end of the book, I felt that Ran's story thread was probably my favourite of the three main ones. However, I do remember being a little bit bored of his point of view at the start of the book because it was very much just him going, oh no, am I going mad? I might be, I might not be, I might be, I might not be. Why is Min crawling all over me? I don't understand that. She's kissing me. She's probably just trying to embarrass me. I have feelings for Min. I am a dirty boy indeed. His vehemence against seeing women put in danger or being hurt in any way continues to be a main aspect of his character. And we see that in how he handles Colavere and how he 
reacts to Kulavir hanging herself after he strips away her nobility instead of executing her for treason. I did quite like the tragic aspect of that, like it was almost like a predetermined fate that he was trying desperately to avoid, uh, but then she ended up hanging herself anyway. I do have to wonder if all of this Rand can't bear watching women die stuff is going to lead up to his mind eventually snapping when either Elaine, Avienda, or Min finally gets killed. I mean, we got a glimpse of that. Was it last book when Avienda, I think, got killed, but he was able to reverse time because of his balefire at that particular point? And also, actually, now that my mind goes down that path, um, there's more foreshadowing on that front with how way back a few books, when he was in the Stone of Tear, he tried to reanimate someone with the power, and Moraine was desperately telling him not to do that, because he wasn't actually bringing them back to life, he was just puppeting them with the, with the power, which is pretty fucking dark. Oh no, I feel like I've just unlocked some foreshadowing that I, <laughs> that I hadn't picked up on yet, live, mid-recording. I like that we revisited Shadow Lugaf in this book, I said that wrong, I'm gonna continue, this isn't the blooper reel, we're still going, and um... <laughs> Yeah, I like that we revisited it because it's definitely one of the more curious aspects of the law. Like, there's this great evil in um, in the world of the Wheel of Time, right? But it's not the only great evil. There's a different kind of great evil that exists purely within the realm of Shadow Logoff and like the dagger, which also made a comeback with uh, Poor Don Fane, which I was actually really excited to see. I love how that entire chapter played out. Robert Jordan did that thing that I love again, where he's, and again, maybe this is exemplified by the fact that I'm hearing this narrated by a fairly monotone voice, which is what you want in narrated audiobook, by the way. Um, but the way he just works frets into innocent scenarios of, oh yeah, and then Rand entered the tent and he looked around and there was this man over here he'd never seen before sitting next to, and then we get a very obvious description of Pordon Fane and you're like, wait a minute, that's Pordon Fane and like the dagger's described and you're like, wait a minute, that's a dagger. And then, to be fair, this was from Min's point of uh, view, this chapter. And then you see like Rand take an intake of breath and he's like, that's Pordon Fane and it's like, oh shit. <laughs> you know, shit's about to go down. There are so many chapters which are just like, and then we went here, and then there were these people in this building that looked like this, and they were wearing this, and they were talking like this, and they said, don't you look at me like that young lady, and then I was annoyed because I was like, I'm not a young lady, and then it just goes on and on and on and on and on and nothing happens. So when you do get those chapters where in the middle of something seemingly like that occurs, it really perks you up and you're like, wait, hang, wait, what's happening? Also in that chapter, this isn't one of those chapters I would consider boring, by the way, because we also got to meet, um, I don't think it was ever established what relation she was of Moraine, so I kind of assumed sister, but then when I remembered how long Aes Sedai live, I thought maybe she's her niece or something, but we got to meet, uh, <laughs> I forget her name, but one of Moraine's relatives, who is, if I'm not mistaken, one of the rebelling nobles? And I'm guessing also why Rand wanted to go undercover and, you know, see what she's about and talk to her instead of just, you know, I mean, he was trying to avoid another, um, Cor- 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 Colliver? 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 <laughs> What's her name? What's her name? Uh, another one of those situations. So yes, we see Rand injured and bedridden once again. I feel like this is going to happen to him a few more times over the course of the series, but, um, poured on Fane slices him right on the fucking half-healed wound. And we got to see how the Yellow Aja and the Ashaman working together were actually able to heal him and save him from death, uh, whereas otherwise just the regular Aes Sedai healing, even with one of the best healers in the entire world, would not have done the trick, which I think is a really neat way of showcasing, look, this is what happens when both halves of the power manage to work together. And it was also a neat way of like shoving that in the Aes Sedai's face as well, like, look, you know, yeah, male channeling, you've, you've had it beaten into your minds over the last few thousand years that that's terrible, but actually, look what it can do. I'm sure it'll all go tits up in a few books and they'll have to murder all of the Yashaman, but, you know. For this moment, for this chapter, it was pretty good. I like, by the way, speaking of Yashaman, how we constantly get, like, tiny bits of foreshadowing, like how there's this one who's just constantly muttering to himself and you're like, that's probably not sane human behavior. It's the one that Rand has following him around, isn't it? Like his understudy or whatever, he's constantly like muttering to himself or staring off into the distance and not hearing what Rand says to him. It's like, he's clearly a Chekhov's madman. Speaking of madmen, there was this wonderful moment where Min revealed to Rand that one of the visions she'd had of him was of two people, both of them, I think it was worded this way, it was like both of them were in some way Rand, like the same soul, and then one of them absorbed the other one. 
and Rand was able to realize that this meant that Luz Ferrin in his head was real and that he was not quite yet going mad and hearing voices in his head and that actually meant we had a happy Rand for a couple of chapters you know before he got stabbed into a coma you've got to take a happy Rand where you can find him honestly but something I did find a little bit sad is by the end of a book he was starting to doubt whether the voice in his head was real again and I get that it's like being told by a doctor that something that's going on with you is perfectly normal and you feel happy about it and and then, you know, a few months later, you're like, but what if they were wrong? I'm fine, by the way. And then finally, from Rand's perspective, we get the showdown against um, Ishamael. Nope, wrong one. We dealt with him a while ago. Samael, that's the chap. Um, Rand just wakes up from his coma and goes, fuck it. Let's, t let's take on Samael here and now. I've noticed we haven't got long left in the book, so I should probably get on that, right? I really enjoyed this chapter of him invading Ilion. Um, and then him following him into Shadow Logoth and like finding the maiden which they'd lost about halfway through the book there as well. The fight kind of ended in an anti-climax with Rand having to kill the maiden because she was being devoured by, uh, let me look up another noun, Mashada. Uh, and he's like, oh, I can't let that happen. So he kills her with Balefire instead, which kind of removed her that from ever happening to her, right? But don't I remember hearing that that also, like, burns them out of a pattern? Isn't that also, like, kind of a fate worse than death? Because it means... It doesn't mean she never existed, I guess. It depends how far back he burned her. I don't know how all of this works, I'm sorry. And again, this might have been explained in little details here and there, and I've just forgotten because it's taken me um, over a year and a half to get to this point in the series. I do apologise. Feel free to remind me in the comments below if you remember and I don't. There's a point in the final battle where Rand slips and loses his footing or something and grabs onto a ledge and is unable to um, channel because he knows that Samael will be able to find him if he does so and he is helped up by a mysterious man and this mysterious man we find out is also able to channel because he also shoots balefire later on interestingly this balefire clashes with Rand's balefire and makes the world go all wibbly because that's a paradox my dudes there was a little touch i liked where when it happened Rand saw double of everything and at first you think his vision is doubling but when he remembers that moment later on he remembers it as being like double vision again which leads me to think that wasn't his vision that was literally like an effect in the world because of the effects of balefire clashing anyway i of course have my theories about who this mysterious man may be and i of course may be wrong on all fronts but i'm pretty sure that somehow it is one of the forsaken and i say pretty sure for a reason we'll get into but i say forsaken because they talk about how oh you know if they let rand die here there would be too many plans undone and all of this and i think if i remember right either earlier this book or in the previous book there was a s sect of forsaken who were kind of plotting either against or just differently to uh, Samael and Grendel, right? There were like two different factions of Forsaken at work there. And I'm willing to believe that this guy is a Forsaken who belongs to the former faction and wants Samael out of the picture. And for some reason, probably wants Rand to be crowned as king of the world or at least king of um, Ilion, like he is at the end of a book. For whatever reason, the things Rands are doing are all according to some Forsaken's plan, I believe that wholeheartedly. Perhaps they want him to unite the world and then turn him evil so that they can... I mean, jeez, what of a Forsaken even after at this point, right? If they want to side with Rand. But that's just a conversation for a whole different time. Either way, the reason I say it would be weird for it to be one of a Forsaken is because Rand didn't feel them channel. He couldn't sense them channel Balefire and he couldn't sense them open a gate to leave. Um, which is weird because, I mean, he should have been able to do that. And I have a couple of theories as to why he wasn't able to. <clears throat> First theory, less likely theory, they're not using Saidar. Saidar's the male one, right? They are somehow using Saidin as a male. Second theory, they are using the true power, which is something that is mentioned a few times in this book from the point of view of that weird, unique murderal. There seems to be a difference between the one power and the true power, the true power seems to leave you with black spots in your vision, like, permanently, and they're, like, a really good sign of the fact that you've been using this power or whatever. They make it they make it clear that you're super powerful or whatever. So I'm guessing there's a lot of lore there which we, is yet to be explored, 
or I've just missed it, leave a comment. I mean, the fact that it's called the True Power means that they could have mentioned it way, way earlier in the series, and I would have just thought it was another way of them mentioning the One Power. Perhaps that was Robert Jordan's idea all along, to be to be like, hey, they're going to think I'm just talking about the One Power here, but soon they're going to realise that I'm not. But yeah, he uh, quote-unquote wins his battle with Samael, as Samael gets devoured by the alt-tab, Mashada. Alt tab. <laughs> I keep forgetting its name for some reason. And he is named King of Ilion. He's offered Kingship of Ilion, not just because he conquered them, but because books ago he ordered Tyr, Ilion's ancient enemies, to send them food because they were all starving. And so the guy was like, yeah, you conquered us, but also you, you made sure we didn't starve. So like, yeah, Ilion's yours, dude. And as he is declared king of Ilion, at the same time, his Ashaman declare him king of a world. And I find that interesting because this is literally the halfway point for the series in terms of books. I don't know about word count or anything like that, but um, I don't know if uh, Robert Jordan specifically planned for there to be 14 books. Obviously, he didn't live to finish the amount of books that there were, but I know, for instance, George R. R. Martin has spoken about how Game of Thrones was original, or Song of Ice and Fire, sorry, was originally going to be a trilogy, and then they just kept needing to be more and more books added onto the series. Um, but if this was specifically meant to be the halfway point, I find it fitting that it's almost like Rand's taken over all of the biggest cities at this point in the world, or at least in the part of the world that the Wheel of Time takes place in, um, and he's kind of hit a point where he is now the Emperor, and he is now going to be having to face outside threats like the Shan Chen. We'll get to their entrance later, by the way. Moving on to Egwene's POV chapters and the people around her, I shouldn't say, you know, this character's POV chapters, because a lot of the time, their main narrative thread is also told from the people perspective surrounding them. This isn't the Song of Ice and Fire where we've got, you know, Bran 1, Bran 2, Bran 3, and then, you know, you know how it goes. I probably have the least to say about Egwene's point of view, because I think the least amount happened, at least as far as I can recall, but I really enjoyed seeing Egwene um, wield her power as the Armalan. She became the Armalan in this book, right? Okay, and even my notes or Wikipedia tells me whether she became Armalan in this book or if that happened at the end of the last book. But either way, we get to see what Egwene is like as Amalan, and uh, I really, really liked it. It's She's, like, the perfect character for it. Like, she's got the kind of, um, the... <sighs> She's one of the rare humble leaders in the world of Wheel of Time at the minute, but also she's got like this quiet strength about her, which I really appreciate. She's got to contend with other Aes Sedai not recognising her as a true Amelon and being set up as basically a, pup a puppet Amelon. And she's like, no, I'm not going to take that. They've given me power. I'm going to damn well use this power. Obviously, this is in conjunction with her powers as a dreamer as well, which continue to be varying levels of interesting. I know that a lot of the stuff in Egwene's kind of area of this book was also told through the perspective of Avienda, and the only note I've got about Avienda's POV is that it is tiring. I get it. Wetlanders are weird. If I have one criticism about the way Robert Jordan writes, it is that he takes one point and just drives it into the fucking ground in a perspective. We get it. Wetlanders are weird. We get it. Nynaeve doesn't like people. <laughs> if there is a definitive characteristic for a character, it will just get driven into you to the point where you wish they would talk about anything else, and that is the reason why Matt's perspective this book is my least favourite part about this book, is what drove me away from this book most of the time, and is what I am least looking forward to talking about. In this book we really explore how much of a misogynist Matt is, like, how he treats them, bloody women, always doing this, always telling him to go here and do that, ooh, this one's pretty, ooh, I like how this one looks. And Matt's main plot thread in this book is how the Queen of Ebu Dar basically chases after him and wants to be his lover, or wants him to be her lover, more accurately. And sitting from a 2022 perspective, this is really poorly written, in my opinion. It's meant to be written as Matt gets a taste of his own medicine, but does kind of like it in the end, but it comes across more as Matt gets literally raped by the Queen, and it's played for laughs. And it's not like he's getting a taste of his own medicine, because he's written as a good character who doesn't exactly force himself on women. He's not the best with them, but they've always been written as liking his, you know, advancements towards them. And I'm not opposed to the dynamic of, you know, a woman, a powerful woman wanting Matt for her lover, 
and that happening, but it was just approached the wrong way in this book, sadly. And I won't spend too long labouring over it, like Robert Jordan does, um, but... I just, I didn't enjoy it, and it was just so prevalent in this book. There was so much text written about it, and I just spent most of my time listening to it with my eyebrows raised. It really highlights that this book was written a few decades ago, um, and it really highlights the binary male-female nature that Wheel of Time is fascinated with, which, again, doesn't age too particularly well, but I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say it's the worst thing ever written. It's just wasn't for me. Matt also spends a lot of his time in this book trying to protect Egwene and Avienda and Nynaeve, women who have shown time and time again that they are very capable of wielding literal magic powers and protecting themselves, but Matt Matt, Matt needs to protect them, and they constantly frustrate him as well, hence the bloody women thing I mentioned earlier. The whole Elaine and Nynaeve searching for the Bowl of the Winds thing should not have taken an entire book. That is the other main thing that drove me away from this book. It was not interesting. And it would have been believable that they were just able to go, we found it in the dream. We know where it is. It's difficult to get there because there's bad people there. That would have been more interesting. Yeah, I won't belabor my point here, but overall, this entire corner of the book was just, just probably the biggest wet fart I've seen in the entire series so far. I was told a while ago that books 7, 8, and 9 are like known as the slog, uh, and I'm guessing this part of the story is part of a reason why. But hey, they finally found a bowl of a damn winds. Well hey, I cheered. Now please fix the damn weather. Don't spend an entire book trying to fix the weather, please. Okay, that's the general overarching plot done. Let's look through my notes and see if I forgot anything. Luckily, I was keeping notes for the first time in a blurble reasoning because I had a feeling this kind of thing might happen. Okay, so first of all, in the prologue, or the procog, as I've written, uh, I really enjoyed Savannah's perspective on the battle at the climax of Lord of Chaos. It's nice to, like, be like, here's an event that you've already seen, um, but from a completely different point of view, and it shows just how clueless she is about what she's doing and what's going on. And the fact that someone like her should be in a position of power in the first place feels very sadly true to life. I also enjoyed the snippets of point of view we got throughout the book of Elida, the Amalan seat in the actual White Tower. We get to explore her vanity, um, her, you know, how she's clutching to power, how everyone clearly hates her, and how she slowly discovers that she's being manipulated by the Black Archer. We also got to see the death of Pedron Nile, which um, my notes say, fuck yes, in big capital letters, and then Valda as Lord Captain Commander? Oh no. In chapter 2, I really liked the imagery of Rand and Min touring the battlefield to keep an eye on fakers among the dead. It's kind of like a dark, twisting version of like a royal procession of like a lord and lady walking among crowds. Oh, I also put that I wasn't sold on Perrin's nose making him a damn empath. They really stretch Perrin's ability to figure out what's going on with people because he can smell them. Um, yeah, yeah, I know animals can, like, communicate via smells and everything, but I don't know, it just came across wrong to me, apparently, five months ago. Also, Perrin doesn't feature very prominently in this book. I think Rand staged an argument with him and had him to go, go somewhere, and everyone's meant to think he went home or something. Another one of my notes regarding Perrin is that he's still having arguments with Fael because Fael's still jealous, even though I thought they figured this out last fucking book. Dashiva is the name of the Ashaman I mentioned earlier, who continually mutters under his breath and loses his attention, and all over it in his that I am immediately suspicious of him when he is introduced. I guess that's worth remembering, actually. I'm not just suspicious of him going mad, I'm suspicious of him being an undercover, like, forsaken agent or something. I forgot I was suspicious of him about that. In chapter 7, we learn that Rand shaking his head is a tick from him repeating never again regarding the Aes Sedai locking him in a box. Interestingly, from Perrin's point of view, he thinks that this is a sign of Rand going mad. And I guess you could argue it might be, but it's more trauma-induced. I like how throughout this book that is referred to in terms of trauma as well. It's not something Rand just shakes off, it's something that stays with him. Like, he gets claustrophobia now. And the way in which people talk about this having happened to him when he's not in the room, it's like some big royal scandal, you know? Like, oh my god that happened to him? Like, he, he acts so normal, but, like, he's dealing with that shit, you know? I really like how it's done. I really liked Matt recognising the Dark Friend in Chapter 14 at the horse race from, like, many, many books ago. It really feels like a callback that reminds us of how much time has passed within the books, even. You're like, wow, 
that person from all the way back then, it really makes you like look back on the journey. I also really like the character of Cad Swain as like this legendary Aes Sedai who's super old and hasn't been seen in years, that's a really cool idea. I like that she pops up and immediately makes Rand think he's going mad and shakes him, <laughs> whether she means to or not. Interested to see what goes on with her character as the book goes on, or series goes on I should say. One issue I do have with Robert Jordan's writing regarding the villains of the story, like the Forsaken, is sometimes it feels like the characters are in on something that we're not. This could just be me, a, a product of me forgetting important things that happen. Um, but I've got a note which just says, Chapter with Savannah and the guy with the box leaves me frustrated. Am I supposed to be following? Kadar and the coal box? The watch have a true power and the black specks? Question mark. Of course, as the chapter kept going, we were kind of made aware of like some of these things like Kadar was Samael, if I remember right. Um, I still don't entirely remember what a coal box was. It was meant to be some invention from, like, the ancient times, but I, yeah, I don't even remember anymore. I've got an out-of-context note which just says, one of those heroes heralds the end of ages, which apparently I found interesting. I think this was in regards to the heroes which constantly get reincarnated. And I think I found it interesting because the end of ages being a thing. It's mentioned in the blurb of these books that this is an age when time itself is threatened. And I've mentioned before in these videos that I'm wondering just how much of a threat the threats in this book are if we know that there's ages that come after. But I guess it's all about making sure that the wheel of time keeps turning, right? I have a prediction. I think Brigitte is going to be the daughter of the Nine Moons. She has a very healthy relationship with Matt. That, um, but I do think this could blossom into the first healthy relationship he's ever had. And I just think it makes sense if a daughter of a nine moons, the reason no one's heard of it is because it's a title from a different age. Vacuoles are also mentioned as pocket dimensions, which will definitely come up again, right? I bet we've seen a few of those, like for Dimension Matt entered to get his free answers or whatever. That might be where Moraine is still trapped after killing, um, what's her face? Oh my god, I haven't had to remember her name for a while. The Evil Lady. I do think Marine is still alive, by the way. That's a theory. Let's talk about that now before I forget. Min mentions towards the end of a book that the only one of her visions that did not come true was one regarding Marine. And I don't remember if uh, that vision has actually been mentioned to us before, but it seems to imply that Min thinks Marine should still be alive, but she's like, well... Moraine's dead, so that vision failed. The whole point of Min's visions is that they don't fail, and I get that Lan's bond was broken, but also, if Moraine ended up in a vacuole or wherever she went, um, wouldn't that imply that she's so far away the bond might have been severed? Or maybe she severed it herself as she was dying? It's been a while since I read that chapter, so maybe that's impossible, maybe I'm misremembering some things, but that is my theory. But Min's viewing was something about um, Rand would most likely fail if he didn't have Marine's help. So that's kind of a bummer. Nynaeve finally gets over her fucking block. And I find it interesting that Lan uh, enters her life very quickly afterwards. It felt very like, we have finished this plot thread with Nynaeve, we're going to have to give her a new one, throw Lan at her. <laughs> Part of me was wondering if Lan becoming her warder would be what broke her block, but um, no, it was because she finally fully surrendered because she was drowning. If I remember, this is around a time when I, you know, stopped reading for a few months, so I apologise if I got that wrong. The chapter where I picked the book up again is the one where Alviarin shows Elida her true colours as a person of a black archer and essentially takes charge. In chapter 33, the whole Rand and Min thing finally boiled over the edge. I mean, they'd already bonked, <laughs> but he finally tells her he loves her. Um, but then he tells her he's a terrible person because he also loves Elaine and he also loves Avianda. And Min's like, yes, yes, I know, I know. And finally the whole loving quartet thing is out in the air. This was a portion of a book where a lot of things that have been built up for ages were finally you know, coming out. I absolutely love the foreshadowing at the start of chapter 35, where this is after Rand's happy because Min's told him uh, her vision about, you know, the two people, one absorbing the other, and Rand realises this means he isn't mad and that Luz Ferrin is real, although he hasn't heard from Luz Ferrin in a while. Um, he's, he's very elated. He says, I am the dragon reborn, and today I can do anything. And I went, uh -oh. And sure enough, uh, that's around the time he meets Bordon Fane again and he gives him a good old coma stabbing. Rand insisting to Cad Swain that Luz Ferrin is real moments before he gets stabbed, or I guess sliced, um, is is very kind of sad. He's depicted as still kinding sound of desperate about it. Another chapter in this book I really, really liked is the end of Matt's perspectives in this book. In chapter 39, the Shonchen invasion of Ebu Dar, 
it was just masterfully done. It reminded me of, and honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Game of Thrones took inspiration from this chapter or something, but it reminds me of one of the final episodes of Game of Thrones, the sacking of a certain city, which I will not spoil. It reminds me of that and how it just builds up and builds and builds and then gets crazier and crazier. I love the initial foreshadowing dropped by Nynaeve about there being a storm coming, and then, you know, what's his face? Olvar? That's his name. Olvar goes missing, and that's, you know, that's like a, oh shit, something's wrong moment. Um, and obviously, what goes wrong isn't related to Olvar going missing, but as a reader, you understand that Olvar being missing at this crucial moment is going to mean something very soon. And of course, that leads to Matt searching the city for him, and as Matt is searching the city, he hears these rumours of a riot, and he's like, oh, that's probably what happened with us earlier in the city, but they keep persisting, they're in the wrong place, if I remember rightly. And then there's these massive booming noises, and he gets down to the docks, and he sees ships fighting in the distance, and then eventually it becomes obvious that this is an invasion of the Shan Chen. And the city, which is painted moments before as just being like, oh, you know, people are selling sweets, he's talking to people about where Olva might be, it's typical city stuff. By the end of a chapter, the city has erupted into these two armies clashing, the Shan Chen and the Army of the Light. And it just played out like cinematography in my head, like I could see it shot for shot. This is a chapter which I am really hoping will be faithfully recreated in the Wheel of Time Amazon series at some point because I think they could do some really fun things with it. They need to give it a big budget, though. I don't love the Shan Chen as an enemy, but it's clear that, like, they're here for good this time. This is going to be the big, long-rumoured Shan Chen invasion, and it's going to be a major plotline of the next few books, probably. It's going to test Rand's martial prowess as an emperor, trying to, you know, have all of these different cities working together, pushing them back. It'll be interesting, to say the least. But... Would you believe it? I believe that is everything I have to say about A Crown of Swords. When I started recording this video, I was worried um, because it took me five months to read this book that I wouldn't remember half of it. And again, I did have aids like the internet and my notes, but um, hopefully I've covered pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about. If I've missed anything notable, feel free to leave a comment and I'll reply with what I thought about it. You know, you'll probably trigger my memory about it. But yeah, as a reminder, the next Blurble Reasoning will be on Neil Gaiman's uh, American Gods, the book, um, at least as long as I enjoy it enough to get through it. Sorry, let me amend that. Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett's American Gods, and actually there's been a few audio productions of it. I'll specify which one it is uh, right now in case any of you for some reason want to listen along. It's the one that has David Tennant in it. Because of course it is. But that doesn't mean I'm abandoning the series, it just means that after that book I will then go on to the next book in this series. So thank you very much for watching or listening. Leave a like if you liked the video, leave a comment telling me what you thought about my thoughts, and then I'll leave a comment saying what I thought about your thoughts, and then you'll leave a comment letting me know what you thought about my thoughts about your thoughts. Okay, enough of that, here's some bloopers to leave you off. Bloop. Egwene Alvir and Swan Shan- Sh fuck, that's a hard name to say. Bloop. Egwene Alvir and Swan Sanche attempt to manipulate the Aes Sedai and Saladar against Elida- Elida's- fuck. The, pro <laughs> the problem I'm having here is that I've heard all of these names audibly and I've never seen them written down. Bloop. Egwene Alvir and Swan Sanche attempt to man- <laughs> Egwene Alvir and Swan Sanche and... Oh my god. Bloop. By the end of a book, Rand's point of view chapters were my favourite. Oh my god, next door, why? Bloop. His vehemence against putting women in... Bloop. His vehemence against putting danger in... Fucking god damn it. Bloop. I did quite like the tragic aspect. Fuck. Bloop. I also really like the character of... Oh fuck, what's her name? Bloop.